Hello everyone, good morning, Win SQ. I hope and pray that every one of you is doing well. I'm sure in the next few weeks, we will go back to normal. But until then, we need to adhere to the government's restriction for our own safety and for the safety of everyone. I am excited to once again meet you for another exciting adventure of the life of the Thessalonian Church. Just last week, we have embarked on a wonderful series, The Hope of Christ's Return, covering the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, and it was an exciting journey, indeed, for all of us. Many corrections, many warnings, and most of all, encouragement made by Paul, which is true to the church in his time and true to us today that the day of the Lord is coming and that we need to be ready. So before we go and dive into another great adventure, let us all start this series with a word of prayer. So let us pray. Father God, thank you for this wonderful day. I pray that you will open our hearts and our mind to receive your word today, O God. And that, Father, that we may be able to practice them in our day-to-day -day life so that it will give you honor and glory. And Father, we just entrust this day to you and we praise you and, and glorify you in Jesus' name. Paul's ministry in Thessalonica obviously touched not only Greek-speaking Jews there, but also the Gentiles. Paul and his companions founded a church in his second missionary journey, which is found in Acts chapter 17. Their success in evangelizing the city enraged the unbelieving Jews and Gentiles. Uh, the uproar forced this missionary to leave town. Paul eventually made his way to Corinth where he stayed for a year and a half in, in the home of fellow Jewish tent maker Aquila and Priscilla. And from there he wrote 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Impressed by the faithfulness of the Thessalonians in the face of persecution, Paul wrote to encourage the Christian in that community with the goal that they would continue to grow in godliness. With that in mind, Paul taught the people that any spiritual growth should be ultimately motivated by their hope in the ultimate return of Jesus Christ. And so, to a group of young Christians with questions and uncertainties, Paul offered the hope of Christ's return, providing both comfort in the midst of questions and motivation to godly living. Paul pictured for them that the glory of Christ awaits them and that they must therefore continue to shine even in the midst of terrible conditions. So when that day comes, they will not only see the glory of God, but also the glory of God in them. So when Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians from Corinth, Paul probably had received a second report from the city detailing continuing question and problem regarding the end times. So several of Paul's reference indicated that some in Thessalonica were deliberately misleading new believers even to the point of false teachers forging letters to make them look as if they had come from Paul. Uh, the apostle therefore took extra care in this letter making sure that the Thessalonians understood not only his views on the end times but how to live in the light of Christ's return. Paul knew that the hope in Christ would encourage perseverance in godly living. And hope is exactly what we lack today. One of the great roots of this gradual slip into increased self-centeredness is the lack of hope. As you read the words of 2 Thessalonians, may it then allow us to rekindle our hope and fan into flame our desire to live in God honoring ways. So the second letter of Paul was written shortly after uh, uh, some scholars said 12 months after. So it's not that long. So our first chapter starts with having a good balance. Have you heard someone saying that you are too heavenly bound but no earthly good? Being heavenly minded does not result in isolating oneself from the world, ignoring contemporary issues or declining to be involved. Being heavenly minded results in attempting to please God who has given us the work to do in this world. Heavenly bound but with earthly good and that means having the mindset 
and the attitude of love towards each other and that this love grows more and more in other words love for more having that mindset of the kingdom and at the same time living as godly citizens here on earth so a proper balance is much needed as we wait for the day of the lord which reminds me of the quote of albert einstein he said life is like riding a bicycle to keep your balance you must keep moving if you want to learn how to ride the bike the secret is keep moving you must have the intention to keep moving no one wants to ride a stationary bike unless you want to lose some weight but you don't usually get a bike and just have the intention to sit on it right i remember when i got my first bike i was 14 years old and it was a play bike it was a christmas gift from my uncle but anyway my cousin came for a visit and we took the play bike for a drive since there was no nut to stand behind she sat in front of me as i held to the steer but we came across a downward road so i held on tightly to keep it steady as i kept it steady and we were moving downward she started to scream and i also started to scream then halfway down the bike started to wiggle and when and when the bike wiggles that is a sure sign of panic and yes i panic since there was a fork on the road i took a sharp turn but it was too late i realized that the road turning right had sand on it and life was never the same <laughs> we both fell as the bike hit the brakes the sad part was i fell on her since she was sitting in front to cut the long story short we made it out alive with some bruises <laughs> and i'm glad that my cousin still loves me to this very day but i won't I won't be sure that if she still ride a bike with me. But I hope one day I get a second chance. I can't turn back the hands of time. But if I had more clear understanding as how wheels and sand work, then I would probably have not taken that sharp turn. As long as I was moving and I had the balance, I will make it down safely. So with the Thessalonian church as an awesome example of balance and momentum. So let me entitle this conversation, <laughs> Balance, Balance Spirituality. The church in Thessalonica, as we learned in the previous series, they were a model church. But also, as we, have, as we will learn today, that they were also a thriving church. Because in the midst of severe persecution, this church is growing more and more, even in the most dire situation, by remaining faithful. On top of that, they were being persecuted not because of their careless or irresponsible attitude, but they were persecuted for the sake of the gospel as they turned from their idols to worship the living God. They continued to live moral lives in contrast to the pagans living in their day. However, this brought about persecution and affliction to them. But Paul commended them that in spite of that, they did not take a sharp turn they uh, have kept their balance and momentum and so we must learn today that in life's ups and downs we should keep the balance of an upright life and continue to grow in love steering it straight as we wait for the coming of the lord many christians today stop growing and so that they have tipped the scale to the other side and took a sharp turn thus the end result is a hard fall and a confused outlook in life sometimes we think that age and experience are the basis of maturity uh, that if you reach a certain level of spiritual gifts then there is no need to go to church no need to read the word no need to serve but paul's definition of maturity was keeping balance and momentum Paul, in this letter, encourage us today to continue to grow in our faith and to grow in our love for one another and endure what, uh, as we wait for the day of the Lord. 
So if you remember during the time of the captivity in Babylon, Jeremiah wrote, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. But in that promise came the admonition and encouragement to also remain in Babylon and be good citizens, to plant garden, raise their children, be part of, uh, 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 be part of the be part of the community, uh, pray for uh, the success of Babylon. Why? Because uh, they will have to remain there for the next 70 years. Realizing that God has a plan, a great big plan, but in the light of that promise, in, in, in light of that plan uh, that we have in Christ, but in light of that promise that when Christ will come again and establish his kingdom, there is also the reality of living in the now, as godly citizens of that kingdom. So this is the truth that we will catch in this conversation. And this truth is, our call is to live worthy of Christ today until the Lord's day. Worthy, uh, axios, the Greek word, which means it focuses on what kind of life you live in response to your relationship with Christ. The challenge is on us to decide to live up to and respond to that standard of Christ in the light of what Christ has done for us. This means we should conduct ourselves so that our lives balance the axis. Only then our life is one of total devotion to the gospel. Can we hope to balance it against his life, Christ's life, of total devotion to what he has done for us? So in the light of Christ's return, while we wait for the day, our lives should match God's standard of living. This means we must be good citizens of the kingdom now because our call is to live worthy lives of Christ today until the Lord's day. Which brings us to Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. The two letters have similar themes as it addressed some of the same issues that the church in Thessalonica has experienced. Add to that, the Thessalonian church was confused as to the teaching that they heard about the coming of the Lord, that this news ha has brought discouragement to them. Why? Because they thought that the, the, the day of the Lord has already arrived. In, uh, as a matter of fact, they thought that they missed that glorious day. Can you imagine how stressful that is? I mean, it's not like that you uh, miss the bus or a train and you can always take the next one. But here, after hearing what they have, uh, that after hearing the day of the Lord in the first letter, the uh, wonderful uh, coming as a thief in the night and uh, with splendor and glory, and then they missed it. I mean, that's, some, uh, that's unforgivable, right? So that is their problem. That is why they're stressed. And since the Lord has already returned, uh, they thought, and then why are they still suffering, right? It seemed that the Thessalonians had sent a message to Paul full of self-doubt and frustration as they assumed that the coming of the Lord has already happened. Knowing their need for affirmation, the Apostle Paul, together with his team of leaders, wrote a brief yet potent letter of encouragement. So let's dive in. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul and Silas and Timothy to the church of Thessalonians in, in God, our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God, the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's associate uh, the same missionaries with him, for they were well known in Thessalonica, having heard, having shared in the original evangelization of the city. So Paul, Silas and Timothy to the church of Thessalonians in God, our Father uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not something that we should take lightly because here Paul was stressing that the church of the Thessalonians in God belongs to God. So means the church was sovereignly birthed by God himself and also belongs to God, their father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in those days, it was uh, the, the devotee who chooses their uh, so-called God. It was the people who chooses their loyalty or pledge their loyalty to their gods. But here... Uh, as Paul stresses, it was God who birthed them and it was God who chose them and that they belong to God. In fact, uh, Paul used father, uh, meaning there it's not just a, a matter of ownership, but a matter of relationship. So it's really a, a good beginning to this letter. This is the foundation of what Paul will build on and it uh, and that this and that the relationship with God 
I, I hindi basta basta. It's a solid foundation. And what a way to start this letter. So what is this letter all about? And so so Paul said this, verse three. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and your and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Paul uniquely thanked the Thessalonian church by giving thanks to God for the church. It is but just proper that we thank God for you, in other words. It is more like a thankful duty and not flattery. So here Paul acknowledges who, to who the success uh, belongs to in the first place and that of course it's the Lord. Paul did not take any credit for the church in Thessalonica. In fact, he was shocked that it grew even in the most dire situation. So all glory belongs to God. But one thing is important in this verse, if you'd see the words growing more and more and the word increasing, their faith is growing more and more and their love is increasing for one another. Now, like what with the phrase growing more and more, what does this mean? It is just like, not just like growing uh, it's, in a, it's in the superlative, <laughs> growing more and more. What do you mean by this? This means uh, to increase above the ordinary degree. In other words, it means hyper growth. It depicts a tree that shoots up rapidly and bears fruit before anyone expects it to. Remember, they were persecuted, but the church in Thessalonica grew even in the most dire situation when growth usually wouldn't take place. So I can imagine Paul was so overjoyed and thankful to God about that. And rightly so, he said, because the church belongs to God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul acknowledges that their increasing faith and love grew was because of God. Paul himself was greatly encouraged that even in the midst of the, the news that he heard that they were being persecuted, even more and more. But in spite of that, their faith and love for each other was increasing more and more. And Paul was consistent as to what the church in Thessalonians was like. They were not only a true model church, but also a thriving church. I like how the NLT phrase it. He, they say, uh, the NLT says it like this. We can't help but thank God for you because your faith is flourishing. Uh, the NLT used, used flourishing. And your love for one another is growing. So when you say flourishing, that in, includes flowers, fruits, right? They... Yeah, they were probably exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, all self-control. As faith was increasing, so were the fruits in their lives. There was momentum. They were growing. Uh, they were unstoppable as far as their growth is concerned. So it's really exciting for Paul to even hear that. And I think for us today, what a wonderful encouragement to see a church, in spite of their difficulties, uh, circumstances, they are still growing, increasingly flourishing more and more. We will see the balance here, their faith and love. As faith is directed Godward and love directed towards other believers, serves to balance and affirm the Christian growth of the church of the, the, the Thessalonians are in axis or balanced. Faith in God is not a static thing. It should be growing since it is a trust in a person. It's either always decreasing or always increasing. It is never stagnant, but always active. We come to God through initial faith in Jesus Christ as a sa as Savior and Lord. But such faith is not one-time event. Rather, our faith in God must grow. Uh, sometimes trials are usually the indication to see uh, the gauge of where our faith is or how, how, how far our faith grew. That sometimes the way to know if our faith is growing is when we have uh, the trials in our life. Let's not wait for a problem in order for our faith to grow. We must continuously nurture our faith in God, reading His Word and doing His work. Because our faith affects every aspect of our life, even uh, when we face difficulties, more, more especially. Or even when we face difficult people, for instance. Di ka na critical thinker. Uh, yung biyaya ng Diyos na sayo. Because lumalago ka. You are growing in your faith. 
in every situation when it comes to dealing with people, when any kinds of problem, facing difficulties, when you're facing with the decisions that you have to make because you are growing in your faith, uh, you will not just decide, you will consult God. In all. So it, it's important that we grow in our faith. Just like the Thessalonian church, even in the midst of suffering, they were still growing. Not only that, they were increasing in their love for each other. Usually, problems make you hate people, right? But in their case, they were increasing in their love. Genuine faith in God is always accompanied by love for others. Hindi mo pwedeng sabihin na love mo si Lord and then you hate your brothers, right? Tingnan na lang natin yung ating Facebook. Andyan yan, sige, tingnan nyo. We write, I love you, Lord. I'm blessed, Lord. You're my redeemer. We quote Bible verses and then... Uh, in another day, we blame people for our misfortune. So we see the imbalance there, right? And then the next day, we edit it because we didn't like, we didn't actually like what we said. <laughs> Sounds familiar, right? I like what James says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if we claim to have faith and have no deeds, diba? Right? Can such faith save them? Faith in Jesus accompanied by Christ like love for people is an infallible sign of spiritual growth. Amen. So sana po we are growing in our faith and our love for each other. So therefore among God's churches we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecution and trials you are enduring. The word perseverance literally means abiding under a fish swimming steadily under a rough water. It portrays a picture of steadfastness. It has its forward look, the ability to focus what is beyond the current pressure. This word is not a, a grim resignation or a, a, passive, a passive green and bare attitude, but a triumphant attitude facing difficulties. You're not resigning. <laughs> uh, to that difficulty but you are holding on to the Lord's love for you the character of perseverance is continuing in your loyalty in spite of the great trials and sufferings that you are facing so that our kids will see as they will face eventually in life they will see how their parents uh, as examples of ever increasing faith and ever growing love and continually being loyal to God as we live our lives worthy for God in the light of His coming. Let's continue. All of this is evidence that God's judgment is right and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. The Thessalonian church were suffering because of how they were living for God. Uh, that was the reason for their suffering. It's because they pledged their loyalty and their lifestyle changed as they followed the living God. Their trials and suffering only exposes what is already there in their character that emerged through fire and testing. Because of this, they were declared to be worthy of the kingdom, meaning they were already living as good citizens of the kingdom. In other words, his practical living matches his spiritual position. So our call is to live worthy of Christ today until the Lord's day. So when one faces difficulty and affliction for the sake of Christ, Paul encouraged us to endure as it shows us that we trust, we hold on, and we persevere we grow in our faith and we continue to love. It just demonstrates that we are indeed worthy because Christ himself suffered on our behalf. It's a perfect balance. This is the balance of scale of worthiness as their life showed that balance of what the kingdom is all about. It's not all about suffering. That's not what the kingdom is. But what the kingdom is, is living now in the presence as good citizens of the kingdom, the coming kingdom. The already, remember Pastor Butch mentioned, the already but not yet. Meaning we are living as good citizens of the kingdom now as we wait for that kingdom to come. 
Amen? So it is not about that suffering. It's not the suffering that makes you worthy. It's living in spite of that suffering that makes one worthy of the kingdom. Meaning you are suffering because of Christ and his gospel. Living for him in spite of the difficulty. Living a godly life in spite of that. Having your faith mature at the same time living a life that pleases the Lord. That is the perfect balance. It's not having a mental, uh, it's not having that suffering mentality. No. Suffering does not count one to be worthy. That's not it. It is a perfect balance of faith and life and loyalty to God. That's the evidence that their love is ever growing. That's the evidence and that they remain loyal to God no matter what. That's the evidence of how we are made worthy. So here is God's righteous judgment. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. Paul asserts that it is just in the eyes of God for those who afflicts the church to be repaid with afflictions and for the afflicted to receive rest. The passage is about God's justice, not God's vengeance. God is just. There is two sides of the justice of God. Relief or trouble. Relief, which means relax to those that are in Christ. But to the other side of God's justice is trouble. So when Christ comes again, he will bring relief for those who are in Christ and trouble, judgment for those who have rejected him. I like the word relief. Relief means relax. Parang sinasabi ni Lord sa atin, relax lang. Ako ang, I will be the one. You know, like, relax lang. I remember when there's a fight on the street and your brother comes and your brother say to you, relax lang. I'll, I'll take care of you, you know. Ganon. It's like God saying to us, relax lang. I will pay back relief for you and trouble for your oppressors. And then he continued, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. These are traditional apocalyptic symbol, but the reality will transcend the imagery. I'm sure because no words can describe this glorious coming of the Lord. Paul uses metaphors as one that describes a sunset to one born blind. It is undescribable. So most definitely, the reality will transcend imagery. The day of the Lord will be no petty local sideshow. It will be an event uh, of awe-inspiring cosmic splendor like lightning flashing across the whole sky. <laughs> then at last, Isaiah's prophecy will completely be fulfilled in Isaiah 40 and the glory of the Lord will be revealed to all mankind together we will see it the glory of his coming like a blazing fire again to those who are not in Christ it will be a judgment fire but then for those who are in Christ it will be a splendor glory and also a relief uh, from all the difficulty that we are going through now to us who are worthy disciples of Jesus, His coming will be beautiful, glorious. Remember, uh, this is a this is in the previous lesson. He will come like a thief in the night, only to those who are not in Christ. We are sons of the light and not in darkness. Remember, in First Thessalonians chapter five, Pastor Butch pointed out really very clearly to us. Paul admonishes us not to be like the other who were asleep, but we must be alert, self-controlled, but to them who rejects the Lord, he will be he will come like a blazing fire, judgment to those who in this case are the oppressors of their faith in Jesus. What a beautiful promise uh, from the Lord. As we balance the scale of our lives in the light of God's coming, God too will balance the scale of justice. He will give trouble to those who trouble us, and on the other hand, God will give relief from the tension of trial for those who are unjustly persecuted by their enemies. I like what Revelation says. He will wipe away every tears from their eyes. There will be no more death 
mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things will pass away. Amen. What a great, great, great promise for all of us. Oh, amen. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death. Remember that. Verse 8. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. At the time, the Lord Jesus Christ will punish two classes of people. Those who are consciously and willfully rejecting God and those who do not obey the gospel. Today, people do not believe God. This generation rejects the glory of God. It's like they're stuck in this frame and rejects the transcendent God. If this pandemic happens 200 years ago, it would have meant that it was an act of God. But now, it's just about transmissions and vaccinations. We need someone that is transcendent. Only God who knows the system can fix the system. He is not in the system, so he can fix us. So we as Christians who live in this world today have to do every means to share the hope of Christ's return. And, and living in that hope is just not sharing the gospel. It is also living worthy lives uh, today, being the light of a troubled world. That is what the world needs, not just the words of Christ but the life of the Christians as well verse 9 they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord from the glory of his might it's literally they will pay the penalty for the rejection of God they will experience endless or everlasting ruin separation from god's presence is the essence of eternal punishment on the other hand being in the lord's presence will make heaven heaven verse 10 one day there is no date he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day note that he is not glorified only by his saints but in his saints the glory is also in us right now we are living that glory in us if we do not reflect him now then how can we have the honor of reflecting him in the day of his coming like a mirror are you really what you really see are we living mirrors of christ kaya ba natin tapatan yung mga thessalonian church how do we see ourselves Minsan counting problema lang. We give up on God. We start to blame. And we don't grow anymore. How then should we live that will reflect the glory of God? This is exactly what Paul means. That the gospel will be spread rapidly and should be honored. Meaning in their lives as well. Our lives therefore should match the scale of Christ. In other words, like Christ like to be Christ-like because we are citizens of the kingdom and one day we will share in his glory. In the last part of verse 10, Paul applies this point directly to the Thessalonians, the group that will experience the Lord's presence. He assured them that includes you in the context of their presence experience of affliction. That statement is both reassuring and comforting. Their inclusion was because they believed in the gospel. In verse 11, with this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and every deed prompted by faith. Christians do not live worthily in order to obtain salvation, but because they have been granted salvation. Paul's prayer is that Thessalonians will continue the display of their true standing. Our call is to live worthy of Christ today. That's the prayer of Paul, I think, for us today. Our call is to live worthy lives of Christ today until the Lord's day. This is the goal that we must be Christ-like, that our faith in God will bring forth good deeds and that this goodness will be deeply rooted in our desires, meaning it is part of 
who we are and how we think and how we work and more importantly in how we live we pray verse 12 we pray this so that the name of the lord jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace uh, grace of god and the lord jesus christ balancing the scale of our life brings glory to god that is the ultimate purpose of this prayer uh, is that through our life god is ultimately glorified and that god's glory might be manifested in and through us both immediately and when jesus is revealed when this happens the vessel that manifests the glory of god are themselves glorified by association with him in the bible the name stands for the person named his character conduct reputation and everything else about him we have a breathtaking truth that our glory in christ and christ's glory in ourselves the glory of christ in those who through him have learned to endure and to conquer and so to shine like light in a dark place this great work of living worthy of his calling can only happen according to the grace of god it happens by his power favor and and moving of the spirit in our lives may we not discredit our master but be but be but bring credit to him because we are at the end of the day will glory in him how do we live our lives today are we living in the light faithfully as we wait sometimes we have to wait for trials for god to break in into our lives and sometimes we wait for that to happen to connect to god paul encourages us to live worthy lives of the gospel in the light of his coming whether in trial or without our call is to live worthy of christ today until the lord's day so what's our challenge live worthy lives as a christian we should be concerned about our testimonies it is of vital importance of the christian life it is not enough to simply believe something we must behave something likewise we must be an example to others when our lives are in agreement with the word others can follow us and we are worth following so today make a commitment that our life will always be flourishing ever increasing glowing and growing in our faith and love uh, enduring in the midst of difficulty remember first thessalonians chapter 5 you are all children of the light children of the day we do not belong in the night or to the darkness we should live like people of the light therefore our attitude should be people who are in the light living worthy lives are people living in the light while they wait while they wait for the day of the lord let's evaluate how we live now are we tipping the scale are we moving forward are we turning right in a sandy road are we living a balanced life in the light of his coming how can god's glory shine in us when we fight among ourselves so let us be mindful of how we behave in our social media in our koinonia in our schools in our office because in our life we can show that we can show christ in our lives when we use our social media as weapons of destruction parang wala tayong self-control as if we write um, in our timeline like we are possessed people parang biglang nasapian ng masamang espirito and then the next day we edit we remove we take it out the antawag mo doon possessed di ba how can we be a light that will shine when we're still nagging taking a sharp turn and falling on our face at the end of the day and we do not give God the glory di ba we bring reproach to the name of the lord our attitude should match that of who we live for and don't stop growing even you're not experiencing problem kahit masagana ang buhay we still need to grow 
finding ourselves balancing the scale and maintaining momentum so we will not fall into complacency with the help of the Holy Spirit who is always in us until the end of time. We have the power working in our lives to bring us to Christ's likeness one day at a time. My dear brothers and sisters, as we end, grow in your love, learn to continue to be tolerant with one another by being kind to everyone, being kind in our words, in our practice. In times of testing, hang on to the promise of God and be loyal to Him as we balance the scale of our lives and our doctrine. Lord God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the message of Paul to the Thessalonians as it reached our heart through the power of your Holy Spirit. May it change us, Lord, to be more uh, aware that we are living not just uh, to know more Christ more and more, but to live um, in honor of that name, Lord. Father, help us live worthy lives today as we are more mindful of what we say, what we do, Father, what we uh, think, even we, when no one is watching, oh God, may we live worthy for you, balancing the scale for what you have done for us in our lives. Father, we entrust each and every one that is watching here online um, and for those who will watch later. I pray that you will guard their hearts and their mind. They may obey your word and may we obey your word, Lord as we follow you day to day, as we be more like Christ day to day. Help us with the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives working so that we can live for you in our day-to-day -day lives. Father, we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So thank you for uh, joining us here online and we hope to see you next week for another great adventure. So take care everyone and hope to see you. We're not sure if I'll see you in church or we're still online, but regardless, wherever we are, uh, continue to live for the Lord no matter where we are. So we'll see you soon. God bless everyone. Mm -hmm.